Howdy once again, it's Tubal K, Mr. Pete 222, your YouTube shop teacher, and welcome back to the shop. Now today I'm starting a new project, it'll be several parts, I'm not sure how many yet, but over a year ago I bought this kit from uh, PM Research, and it's a little dynamo kit. And there's the number, made in USA. So anyway, if you remember uh, about that time I made this little Stewart engine and then I made another little dynamo of my own design but then I decided I'd really like to make uh, this PM research uh, item and I, I think that was about 60 or 70 bucks I forgot because it's quite a while ago but I thought I'd like to have something that this would would drive and I don't know if this is up to uh, the specifications required the, the speed and all that to run this but I, I'm gonna go ahead and make it anyway and I was always interested in electricity as well as machine shop so let's take a look at what is included in this kit this is the first PM research project that I've ever made and uh, I like the way they had it packed you saw how that was uh, packed safely and uh, it arrived in perfect condition it came with this armature pre-wound you can see that it's been balanced as well Nice little commutator on it, but that's for later. It included this cast iron, boy that is heavy, uh, the main frame, the main body. And you can see that's all got to be machined, and that's what I'm going to start out doing. Because at this point, well I guess that does fit in there, but these magnets, these permanent magnets, will have to fit inside the bore. And it came with two I'm going to call these end bells. I think they got different names for it. But when I worked on motors at a shop, they always call these end bells. This is the aluminum one that fits on the uh, the end that holds the brushes, and this is the other end, which they call the drive end. Aluminum. They are not die cast, but they sure are nicely made. Nice castings. And a little kit of parts here. There's not much. A piece of aluminum, a piece of brass assorted screws way too small I don't really like working in those sizes and in this little bag is the brushes and the bearings they actually included bearings I don't know if they're oil light I didn't even take them out just to examine them but it also included these two nice drawings they really are nicely done I guess it's alright to show these even though they're copyrighted but this is the dynamo kit with uh, the assembly drawing and there are the specifications you can see that it's a 12 volt DC 53 5300 RPM with complete instructions on how to assemble it and then these are the working measured drawings by PM research and they have a website I guess I said that but here's all of the uh, the dimensions and I'm going to start with they call it the frame so let's make some chips is everybody happy in a recent video I made this uh, drill press vise from a casting specialties casting kit so take a look at that that's three parts if, if that would interest you alright uh, what's the first thing to do on this well Nothing on a casting is square because remember there's pattern draft. So even looking at the bottom here, you can see that it's tapered in two directions, and that was called the draft. And that the reason for that is it needed to be able to be pulled out of the sand. And of course, here's the parting line, so you know that it was made like this, and that hole was cored. A nice uh, one inch hole approximately, a little bit rough, but that's what you would expect. Now they have taken this and they've cleaned it on, a, I think they call it snagging, to knock off the, all of the flash, So and the gate came in here. This little boss up here is for the lifting eye. There'll be uh, two holes, mounting holes on each side, four holes on each end to hold the end bells on. But how to start this, because it is just so irregular, and it's even a little tricky to hold in the vise. Now, this could be done two ways. This could be done on the lathe in a four-jaw chuck, being chucked like this, and faced off. That would be a, a pretty easy setup to make, but I'm going to do it on the milling machine, 
simply because I own a bridge port. So let's go on over there and see how I'm going to hold this because it's kind of tricky. You need to hold it right. Remember that neither end is true. And that's how I have to hold it. And I want to mill it off flat such that this end is about the same thickness as this end, not machined at an angle. So all those things uh, have to be considered. Uh, if you're uh, new to machining, this may seem a little difficult to you, but it really all makes sense. So I'll see you at the bridge port momentarily. I'm at the bridge port, obviously, and here's several ways to do this. And I had considered putting it in like this, and uh, that's holding it by the, the two ends. And that probably would work okay, and that could be leveled, not with a level. Never use a bubble level. That's absolutely worthless. But using a, a surface gauge, not an indicator, but just a surface gauge like this, if we get this end and this end about the same, we're really okay. The problem is this has been ground at the foundry, and we don't know uh, how accurate it is. So the way I prefer to do it is like this. The problem with the setup that I just showed you is that we don't really know if they've ground these true perpendicular to the bore. So I would prefer to hold it like I'm going to show you now. And uh, th this is a uh, roughly one inch, but in fact it's undersized. So this is about a piece of seven eight. So I would like to hold it by this because that assures that I'm aligned with the bore. And I'll put two pair of uh, V blocks in there in the vise and set it in like this do you understand now that being supported by the bore assures that this surface here will be parallel with the bore now the problem is how to set it up uh, square this way and here's the way I like to do it. You see what I'm doing now is I'm trying to get this in here so that it's not at an angle. That it's truly, this surface here, pretty much truly true with the, uh, with the vise here or the, the, the table of the machine. So laying a parallel on there and then yet another parallel. One could put it in there like this and then measure both here and here until those distances are about the same. Or bring the cutter up, move it back and forth. There's just so many different ways of doing that. But I'm going to use, again, uh, a surface gauge. And this takes a little time. I won't show it all, but I would adjust that so it was touching there and then come down and see if it was the same here. Back and forth, back and forth, tapping it until I achieve uh, my own satisfaction on that, and then I would tighten it down and I'm ready to mill. So, in a moment I'll be back after I do that off camera, and... But see how I've got that supported. That's the point, and that's just one suggestion, just the way I'm going to do it. Of course, at this time, the, sh the shaft could be pulled out of there. It's not really doing anything anymore. But I took the time to get the measurement right here, the same as here. And then I double-checked it, not that there was a need to, by bringing the uh, cutter over here, touching off, and then touching off again over here. And now I'm ready to mill. Now, according to the drawing, there's no dimension that, but the, uh, to that, but they do have the little... Uh, finish mark on there if you know what I mean that little F that just indicates that that surface is to be machined cleaned up so I'm going to clean this up that is a three-quarter inch solid carbide end mill that is up to the task if you watch the other video you know that I talked about fire scale so the surface of a cast iron piece like this is is very hard, uh, which I call fire scale. There's probably other terms for that. So you're best off taking a cut that is deep enough to uh, overcome that. That is deep, uh, going right on through the fire scale down to good material. I'm probably going to end up taking about a sixteenth of an inch off of this in all. Always wear your safety glasses or goggles in the shop and uh, practice your safety rules.
These machines are out to get you. I'm uh, milling at about 1200 RPM and I'm ready to go. And it cleaned up nicely, so I, I'm done already. There's no need to belabor it and even take another cut. Remember that with cast iron, you do not need uh, lubricant or oil. It is self-lubricating because of all the graphite and the carbon that's in the iron. And there it is. Decent finish, although finish is not critical at all. Sets nice and flat. And this is the basis now for holding it because we know that the base is parallel with this bore. So what's the next step? This may seem foolish because it's already been ground but I'm just machining off the top of that lifting eye boss. Now here's a suggestion for you. It certainly can be held in a four jaw chuck. That's a wonderful way to do it. However, I'm not going to do it that way. But see now with the bottom of the casting machined off, we have some basis for that to be uh, held with the jaw up against that. And it would be nicer to do this on a larger lathe that has longer jaws. But this is off of the Atlas lathe. and. It's, it's kind of a difficult setup to get it centered though compared to doing it on the bridge port. So that's why I prefer the bridge port with the Criterion boring head. But on the lathe, of course, you'd be doing it like this. And you'd have great control over boring. You'd have to keep it a little bit away from the back of the chuck here so that you don't run into the chuck with the boring bar. So consider that on jobs like this. Now maybe you can see why I machined that off and then I center punched. I found the center of it both on the parting line there and uh, from you know this end to this and, and center punched it. Now the overall length here is to be 1.560. They left off the zero which means that uh, they have different tolerances here that you can read on the drawing but that's not all that critical but I'm going to call it 1.560 so I want to take about the an equal amount off of each end. Am I talking too much? So I set the dividers at 25 uh, 30 seconds I forgot what that was in thousands because they're mixing up on this drawing both fractions and uh, uh, decimals no metrics, I'm sorry. But now that's been center punched so I can swing this and mark it on both ends and I'm going to machine to that and when I do the second side on the milling machine I will uh, check it with the caliper here. 1.560. Alright, check out the setup. Notice that I have the machine surface up against the fixed jaw I'm on a parallel to get it raised up high enough to work on and I can see my layout line here and I also checked it with a square. I don't just have it setting on the other face but I checked it with a precision square on both sides always holding a flashlight behind it checking for light and I believe that's quite accurate. So now I'm ready to machine the first side to that line. One more light pass off camera and I'll be on the line. 
Now for machining the second side, there's no need for a square because it's sitting right on the other machined end and I had to use one more parallel to raise it a little bit higher and I think I told you that I was going to take it to 1.560 and check it with a caliper but in fact I would have to take it out to do that so I'm going to use the depth mic. But I'm going to initially of course go by the layout line. Let's see what we got. Should be 560, 562, 561. All right, I'm right on within the tolerance. All right, the next thing I want to do is to bore the hole. And of all things, the diameter is one, one and a third inch. I don't know where they ever came up with that, but. Uh, nevertheless, I've installed the Criterion uh, boring head and it's sitting on a parallel, but now that the vise is tightened down, and notice that I'm still up against the fixed jaw, always the fixed jaw, I will slide the parallel out because I don't want to hit the vise or the parallel with the, uh, with the boring uh, bar. So I got a boring bar in there and I'm going to get it all centered now and I'm ready to, to bore and uh, I can use power feed for that. Now here's how I like to do this. I've already selected a carbide tip boring bar that is the right length and not too slender. In other words I don't want to use a real skinny one like this that's going to flex or one that's too long or too short or I want one that's just right so that's a matter of uh, judgment I guess but anyway I got one in there and I have adjusted the boring head so that I'm at approximately one inch and now rather than using an indicator because this is a rough bore I wouldn't want to use an indicator in there it would it would just fluctuate too much so I <clears throat> have brought that almost into contact and I, I swing it around to the opposite side to see that it's the same distance and then similarly on the y-axis and I'm ready to now take the uh, boring bar advance it just a little bit so that I'm taking a cut and take a trial cut and see if I'm taking about an equal amount off of uh, the different uh, all four sides and I have set the digital readout for zero so I can make some minor adjustments if I need to so that the wall thickness will be the same on all four sides. Alright, several trial cuts have shown that I'm taking about an equal amount off of all four sides and of course the hole wasn't really all that round because it was a cord hole but now that I got it adjusted where I, I think I want it, I'll lock the table in both directions, re-zero the digital readout and uh, take my first cut of about oh, 20 thousandths or so. Now I certainly won't show all of this because a boring operation can be a very boring operation. I am on power feed and I have the stop set so watch this when I reach a little bit past the bottom of the hole. and that cuts the power feed off. Then I'm ready to stop it. And this is a lot of material to remove. But I'll take off another 20 thousandths. If I take off too much, the boring bar will flex. And that may be my last cut. Let's see what we got here. Remember it's supposed to be 1.333. 
I like to stare at digital mics for demonstrations. Oh boy, we're right there. I'm done. I'm done. Now take a look at this. I really want to clean this up. I don't want any dust on there because these magnets will attract that and I'll never will get the dust off, but do they fit? They sure do, and of course there's spacers for all that, which I'll talk about later. So this boring job is done, and uh, out it comes, and on to the next step. Thanks for watching my videos, by the way. The bore turned out very nice, and the magnets fit in there perfectly, as you can see. Now in order to retain the magnets, there's a little spring that goes down here, but there's also a, a spacer that goes in here, and in order to put the spacer in, I have to drill and tap this hole. They call for a size 3. I'm going to up it to a size 440, so I'll go ahead and drill that right now. And I'm going to use the little camera on drill press here, and one of the metric drills that I got here is a present from uh, from Doug Bollinger. Uh, they're metric and they're solid carbide, but I'm going to use this one that pretty much corresponds to uh, uh, imperial size to drill that hole all the way through. It's a through hole, and it'll be tapped 440. That gray iron sure does drill nice, and that was a sharp drill, and then I'll tap it off camera 440. Alright, I just tapped this hole, and I probably only needed a clearance hole there, but the whole idea there is that that will serve as a lifting eye. I think I might have mentioned that when I, after I make the eye, if I ever bother. And this I just made out of half-inch stock that they supplied. It's called the Magnet Spacer with a 440 hole in it, and it is held in place by that little screw. Let's see if I can get it in there. Temporarily, that is. Because the purpose of that is just that. It spaces the magnets. So the whole idea, and this is just temporary, is that one magnet is put in like that. up against the magnet spacer, the other one on the other side. Oh, wrong polarity. So they push up against the magnet spacer like that. And then to hold the magnets in place, this little spring that was provided is inserted and I think I'll need a pliers. That's pretty stiff stiff spring and it just serves to spread them apart and hold them in place and I won't do that now of course until final assembly next thing I'm going to do is uh, to lay out the two holes on this side the two holes on this side that is uh, those are the mounting holes and drill those but I'm going to hold that off till tomorrow because I worked long enough today and I'm going upstairs and watch Jeopardy. I'll see you on the morrow.